Thanks, everybody, for uh, <laughs> taking the time to join us and also listening to us ramble at the beginning of this panel, uh, Collecting versus Trading in Digital Art. Um, I think this is pretty exciting. I know, uh, you know, trading or flipping art can be a little bit controversial, so it should be a fun conversation. Uh, maybe just before we get started, uh, we can do quick intros. I don't know, Matt, if you want to start, just a quick background. Uh, Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, half of uh, Larva Labs. I'm Matt. The other half is John. Um, and we've worked together for a while now, 20 years or so. Uh, did a bunch of different stuff, uh, apps, games, uh, and then got into crypto with the CryptoPunk uh, on Ethereum. And uh, have been kind of in the mix uh, ever since. Awesome. Thanks. And Alex? Hi, uh, I'm Alex Salnikov. Uh, I've gotten blockchain like you know, like eight years ago. Uh, that was a long time ago. Since then, I've been building stuff. And, and Rarible is the latest stuff. It's all started as a big uh, as a big experiment, an emotional side of the projects. And now we are kind of this, I, I believe, very fun marketplace for the digital art and other collectible stuff. Yeah, happy to be here, guys. Awesome, thanks. Um, so yeah, well, just to kick things off, uh, you know, related to, um, uh, you know, trading of art being controversial, there's a, a famous art advisor, uh, Lisa Schiff, who is quoted as saying that, um, you know, the trading of art is, is disgusting. That was, you know, pretty strong sentiment. And so, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a pretty negative connotation. So I just wanted to kind of go around and um, kind of like just get your to your personal opinion, um, you know, whether or not you think sort of like trading, flipping, speculating, you know, whatever we want to call it. Um, you know, do you personally think it's going to good for art in general? Uh, oh, yeah. Let me start here. So in general, I, 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 at first, I'd ask the question, like, how does art originate its value? So in order to understand why people are selling it, we need to understand why people are buying it in the first place. If they're buying it to hang it on a wall, uh, when, when it, what, what happens in, with the digital or with the physical art, um, then, then it, it's one set of value. Uh, I, I believe that this whole market originated because some people uh, like want to have these two opportunities, either to have it in their wallet and understand that it's yours or at some point to sell it. So like uh, not one of each uh, is enough here. So this this two, two, two reasons to have it. And I, I, I believe every one of them is, is, is important here. That's that's why it all started in blockchain. Awesome. What do you think, Matt? I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know if I feel qualified to answer the question in general, you know, sure. um, but I will say, cause I will say that at least on the blockchain side of things, like that's kind of innate in, in the, you know, the previous talk was just talking about was, is it a medium? Well, if you're, if it is a medium, then, then value and exchange is part of it, you know? So that's kind of what's interesting about it. So um, at least from our perspective, uh, with the CryptoPunks, the, you know, there's ownership there, which was interesting, but also the contract included a marketplace too. So you could say that the artwork is, is includes the ability to transact it as well. And that's kind of how we intended it. So, so yeah, that includes the ability then for value to, of the art to overshadow whatever it looks like or anything else about it, which is, you know, in some way distasteful, but also kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure you can separate it and especially even more so on the blockchain, but perhaps, I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. It's a, uh, oh, great. Hi. Lisa, hello. Hi. You, you finally it. made it. Perfect. I was listening to you guys. So I'm sorry I wasn't there, but I was listening to you. All right. Well, and maybe you want to give just a quick intro and then we can, uh, we'd love right. to have you chime in. So first thing first, I'm in Cuba and uh -huh. it's raining. So this is why I couldn't really. Gotcha. But the thing is that it, it took a while because sometimes you have to use a VPN, sometimes you don't. You know, in Cuba there are restrictions and censorship and this and that. So you first have to figure that out. And yesterday I didn't need a VPN, whereas today I did. So anyway, sorry for keep you guys waiting. I was here on time. 
And I work for Galleria Continua, which is an international 30 years ago in San Gimignano in Tuscany. I'm Italian, and the gallery also has spaces, headquarters in Beijing, Le Moulin, which is close by to Paris, um, Havana, we are the first, and so far still the only non-Cuban art gallery in Cuba. We founded our space here five years ago. And we were about to open a new, a new space in Sao Paulo when um, the, the COVID crisis broke over and um, our space, which is a stadium, like a huge like sports stadium, it now became a, a hospital. Yeah. So Galeria Continua Sao Paulo is yet to be open. And we represent over 60 artists internationally. Oh, we also have a space in Rome. We represent over 60 artists internationally. In between them, Ai Weiwei, Anish Kapoor. It's a, it's a, it's a, in, it's an interesting project. It's a big gallery, and um, it's special because it goes from like very young, emerging, 28 years old Cuban artist to Anish Kapoor. So there's a little bit of everything in it. I must say, I'm not an expert in crypto art, and um, the gallery is not a gallery that works with that, that kind of art. But thanks to Snark and, and being a curator of, of the age of quarantine, I became more and more um, informed of what it means um, to be collecting and, and, and buying and selling crypto art. So there you, there you have it. Here I am. Perfect. I love it. Thanks so much for the background. And yeah, so the, the first question I, we were talking about here discussing, uh, you know, Lisa Schiff, she's quoted as saying, you know, speculating or flipping art, you know, it's disgusting. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, generally, um, do you think it's net positive or negative to have kind of a more, you know, speculative market around art and, uh, you know, people kind of trading it? So the thing is that you cannot really like avoid it, I think. So like like every product on the market, whichever market, like at some point somebody could speculate and you cannot do anything. If there's a market, there's a system and there's a, a way to speculate. There, there will always be people who want to make money out of money, you know, out of collecting, out of... So, for instance, I don't know if you know, there's a, a, an, an important work by Hito Style that is about this big, huge um, square in Geneva where you have hundreds of containers that are full of art because you can keep the art there. So there is people who will buy a Picasso and just store it there until it becomes more expensive and, and more valuable and then they sell it. So that's like at the speculative square, like the capital of, of speculativity is in Geneva, which is Switzerland, of course. And like, how can you avoid this? You can't, you cannot even forbid this, forbid this because People will always do that, either the black market or the... So I wouldn't say, like, let's go against it. I would say when you... The important thing is, is, is to be training people to collect responsibly. If you're going to speculate, speculate responsibly. You don't have to burn an artist because you want to become rich. That's wrong. But if you want to make money out of speculating without doing, like, slimy kind of, like, backstage stuff, then yes, that's possible. But you have to know what you're doing. Yeah, that's a super interesting point, sort of the the intent and maybe, you know, honorable speculation versus sort of uh, dirty or slimy speculation. I mean, it's, it's like a paradox. You, you, It sounds like you, there cannot be honorable, but believe me, there can, because there are hundreds of examples in history. Sometimes, you know, they even get, they even, you know, get into a lawsuit because they weren't honest, right? So there is, different ways to do that and of course when a new collector start collecting today and perhaps they don't know much about art they're always like lacking of confidence because they think oh my god i don't know anything about andy warhol should i buy an andy warhol so i think that when you what part of our job as a salesperson is is to train people to collect to be confident not to look at our as an investment, because there's people who will buy a work to put to, to put it on top of their sofa, and they will still ask you, oh, is this artist like going to grow, and is his value going to increase? Because somebody told them to think like that. But I tried to tell them, like, are you really like buying this to sell it tomorrow to make more money? No. Then do not like do not square yourself in that one thing. Of course, it's better to buy something that will you know gain more value because maybe your son will want to sell it. Of course. But still, like it, I think it's 
it's the way that you know our market in general our world in general trains people to think everybody is always thinking about how to make more money whereas collecting is not about make, making money in the first place so i think there are the two dimensions and i wouldn't go against neither of them yeah super fascinating um yeah so matt right before uh, louisa jumped on you had mentioned crypto punks and you know it's the crypto punks project is very cool uh it was the first art project on ethereum that i think was what i was or that i was aware of and i think may have just generally been the first one and i'm curious you know you partially just can you tell us kind of like what was the motivation behind it and you know did you guys think that you were going to attract you know more kind of like mainstream art world collectors like when you were working on you were writing the code um just curious um no definitely not is the answer to the second uh, part of the question uh we i think we came at it kind of um naively to be honest with you uh we had um the we were working on the generator for the characters my partner john was working on that and it was you know kind of fun it was something we had around and you know we were mainly app developers at that point so we were like it would be fun if you could have an app where you collect this stuff like when i was a kid i collected stickers you know and i had a sticker book and on the playground you would like you know i got i got this puppy sticker i can trade you know that's, that's super valuable so we we're like that'd be fun to be able to do that on your phone but we but it was missing something right like it, it was like well who cares like how many of these are there it's not like you know that sense now we're a little more used to talking about it but we were missing that sense of rarity um and so it was kind of on the shelf and then we then we came across ethereum and it was more interesting to us than bitcoin in the sense that it was like a development environment so we could write software for it and it felt like oh like could we make these characters have actual rarity at least in this world and then that sort of started coming together and it took us a, a few tries to get the uh, contract right. It was the first, first Ethereum contract we wrote. Um, and then we released it as like a, a, who knows, you know what I mean? Like, because the question back then was like, do you feel like you own this thing? Like, does it feel rare to you? Like that, it's almost a psychological question more so than a technical question. It's like, do you feel like you own something? And the answer is not clear at that point. Um, and so we just gave gave them away for the most part and nobody took them like <laughs> we made 10,000 of these things and there was like nine, you know like 8,000 something remaining after the first week and we we're like well that was dumb um and then there was a couple articles about it and then people yeah, they were free right so people grabbed them and then it kind of bootstrapped its way to into something and here we are three years later thinking of, you know talking about it which is pretty cool um but yeah no it wasn't like and then it, at some point there, it sort of took a detour into the traditional art world, which was very surprising, but it turned out to solve a problem there, which is, you know, the addition, additioning digital art, which we weren't even really aware of as was an issue. Um, but it kind of became an example of how to do that. So we ended up meeting lots of like cool people in the art world and, and finding out all sorts of analogies over there too, that they were trying to do the same thing, basically like galleries giving you a certificate saying you own this film but you don't really have the film, you know, it's like a piece of video art. Well, what do I own? I own the certificate. Well, that's the same. It's the same as this. It's just, it's a digital certificate instead of like a thing on paper. So once they told us all about that, we're like, oh yeah, this, yeah, this kind of makes sense now. This, is, this, this could work for you too. Uh, but it was, it didn't, didn't expect that to happen though. No. Yeah, I love, I kind of love that backstory. Like, I feel like it adds a little bit to the allure. Um, so like the mystique behind CryptoPunks. It's a Satoshi Nakamoto-esque maybe. Um, yeah, we should have, we should have, <laughs> that would have really sealed the deal there, wouldn't it? Yeah, or if I, this is just a black screen. You need a guy right right now. And they, I should have thought of that earlier. Ruined. All right. Um, yeah, super fascinating. And kind of going back to what we said, it's kind of interesting you mentioned sort of like, you know, ethical collecting or sort of, you know, honorable uh, speculation. I'm curious, you know, in, as Matt was saying, right, the, the trading of the crypto pumps was kind of baked into the smart contract. It's part of how it works. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, how this might change people's collecting behavior. And then also related to your comment on kind of like educating people on sort of good collecting practices. 
Um, you know, what are some of those, you know, what are good collecting practices that we might want to start encouraging folks to have in, you know, with digital art? Right, so I, I'm going to answer it's two different questions. The first one is about really like, again, I'm, since I'm not an expert in crypto art, but I know about the art system, I will tell you this. So the art system that we all know that a guy named uh, Lawrence Holloway named in 1972 is puts the artist in the middle. So you have the artist and then you have all these bubbles, different bubbles in which you have museums, magazines, galleries, etc., etc and they're all connected, we're all in them. Like, in, if you go to a museum and you're just a visitor, even once in your life, in that moment, you're part of the system, right? So this system is the system that normally, like not in crypto art in general, legitimizes art. So when people say, oh, why did, you know, like the, the Catalan banana on the wall, like cost $120,000? Well, because there's an art system that legitimizes it. And we all know this, right? We're all, we all agree. The thing is that what's interesting here is that there are, there have been, and there still are like cases in art history in which some people tried and maybe even managed to fool the system. Meaning that if you will draw, like put a banana on the wall, you're not an artist, you just started off like your career. You put a banana on the wall and you pay the most important art critic, the most important art curator and the most important of your region, whatever, and you pay them to say, that's a fantastic piece of art. Then you, you, you will be legitimized. Like the people will start talking about your, your artwork and they will pay good money for it, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, like a real art critic and a real art curator wouldn't get money to say that especially a lot of money to say that something that's not valuable is very valuable. So I'm, I'm taking the example to extremes. What really happens is something not so radical that is, you know, like favors and, you know, like you're sure that you're a curator and, and you know, you say good stuff about that guy's work, then the gallery will invite you to curate a show. So this already happens. There, there, there is millions of ways to fool the system. Whereas with crypto art, I'm guessing, I'm not an expert, but I'm guessing there are less ways to fool the system because you will always be able to track what's happening, what's going on. So for instance, another example is with, you know, the people that managed to recreate perfectly a Van Gogh or even a Leonardo da Vinci. There is people who really like almost paint nowadays like Leonardo da Vinci did 500 years ago. So these people could like put this, painting uh, it actually sometimes do put the painting on the market and sell it for an incredible price i think that this cannot happen right with crypto art because you will all trace it back to you know where it moved around and if it has an addition it has that addition if it's blockchain you cannot you know fool the system and if you can then you have to be like one day one day people will be able to fool the system but i think that's the difference that it becomes more and more elaborate and more and more sophisticated to be fooled as a system. And people who don't know, for instance, like, you know, when people come up to me and tell me like, oh, I don't understand this artwork, or I don't know why this artwork is, is and this artwork are so famous if the work is so simple, you know, and you start explaining them the art system. I think that the art system with crypto art becomes even more systemic in a way, because you have even more, ways to control it, to trace it, to, 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 for transparency to be there, art has to be crypto, I think. So, I mean, as long as we have both things, it, there will always be some uncertainty. But if we were to have only crypto art, I think we would manage at first to trace it all. And then maybe somebody would invent a way not <laughs> to escape the system. But I think that's an, an interesting difference because nowadays, as as Matt was saying, like with, for instance, with a video, like you say, oh, this video costs $10,000 and it has 10 editions, right? And who knows if the artist didn't sell like 11, you know, like you will never know because the, the world is so big, you will never like under, like come to know if there's an 11, 11th version of it in whatever Uruguay, you know? Whereas with crypto art, you kind of can, supposedly. Yeah, it's really fascinating having the sort of like the central ledger tracking everything. Um, I'm curious, just sort of open question. 
do you think what we're experiencing now with kind of like NFT art collecting is, you know, sort of a flash in the pan or is this really uh, the beginning of, you know, potentially something, you know, much bigger that um, is going to pull in, you know, more and more components of the art world and be, you know, uh, more present in people's lives? Maybe let's start uh, with Alex. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I think that mostly depends on us, on all of us, because uh, if if we kind of mm, if we want we're, if we will, won't be able to fulfill the trust put in it, if if some works will 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 suddenly like uh, lose its value, well, well, sometimes something would lose its value, but if if the technology would fail people. If a lot of people would lose their wallets, if if they would understand that uh, something is still not there, they they would just move on. So far, we have a great momentum of artists to to come on board and experiment with the new technology because uh, artists are always like uh, on the frontier here. They're they're seeking for new ideas, new perspectives to this world, and and sometimes so they they found this. Uh, this technology and and this is a big experiment experiment on on whether the, this will stick or not and uh, this this gave us initial momentum why were at the initial excitement about the whole market and and we kind of need to work uh, our asses off to to get it to stick here to to expand to expand the digital art into a traditional world by displaying it by 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 making a lot of new technology to recreate the the original art market uh, business models, the curation, the galleries, uh, to give the, each of them tools to to promote the artists, to to support, to connect the buyer and the seller, and uh, yeah. So, I I think that's that's mostly dependent on us. Yeah, super interesting, uh, Matt. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I feel like um, short term, it's always almost impossible to predict. Like, I have no idea. But then if I think longer term, then it feels like, yes, you know, like even we were a couple of years ago, we were at that event and at Christie's, which felt like it was sort of this art and technology event. And we were talking to all the art world people and it, it, we're hearing from them and just sort of what we were seeing as this new thing. It's like, this kind of makes sense. Like this feels like a way to do something new. It could happen in parallel. It could merge with the traditional art market. I don't really know, but it feels like something that people would be comfortable with and maybe not traditional art buyers, right? Like the end of that day, we spent all day talking about new technology and blockchain. At the end, they had like famous curators and people from that. And they were like, so what do you think? Uh, how about that blockchain? And they were like, no, I don't like it. And we were like, oh, well. So much for that, but uh, but it really felt like I feel like we were making the case there that like people are very comfortable with with things in a digital world now, and that feeling of ownership is now becoming more common, right? And the younger you are, the more you know strongly you associate with that. So are they going to want to go to a thing and see have a thing on your wall? Uh, no, not really. Like they want to have a thing on their phone. Like that feels like a world that matters to them. So. So it all sort of like, like, when will that happen? Is that this year? Is that two years? I don't know, but we're a couple years into it now. And so you can see it, it gets a little bigger. A few more people find out about it. They have the same questions about it. Like, do I even have the art? Like, and they're like, no, not really. We have to, you know, and you sort of go through that process, right? And then once you come out the other side, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. And that seems to happen, you know, in little waves. So, um, so yeah, I think like, I think about this stuff fairly long-term you now, and it feels like it makes a lot of sense. In, in on that time frame and uh awesome yeah yeah uh louisa is somebody who does come from the more you know traditional art world um and you, you know self-described as somebody who's not you know fully immersed I, in crypto art i'd love to hear you know, kind of your opinion i, I will go to you with with a uh, with an article i read like a, a few weeks ago on the new york times that's titled the unexpected joy of internet art Many museums around the world closed. Art made from the internet for the internet has been a saving grace. So this is what this is the answer to me. Like really, like the pandemic, the global pandemic we're in, to me was a power boost to something, a process that, as Alexander said, was already like, you know, we, you're right, Alexander. We're, we are the pioneers, but the process has 
it started and I believe it will continue to grow and grow and like it has to grow and we saw it grow exponentially because because of the pandemic we all had to stay home so of course like which other internet I mean all the viewing room for instance right now there is our buzz of view, online viewing room on it will finish it started yesterday it will end in two days there are galleries that are selling online but it's still very hard to sell like a, a physical work online because it's not like ikea that you can put a product and see the the thing exactly how it is and be sure that it's exactly what you want etc many people just don't buy online and and it's taking a while for this like the, this generation of collectors the young ones and the old ones to buy art on the internet so imagine for them to actually buy digital art it will take a while it will be the new generation especially because as you said they know the value of owning an algorithm you know whereas like to my mother like owning an algorithm doesn't make sense like she doesn't know what she's owning she, she doesn't have it in her hands so of course there, there, there is it's a, it's a process but it had already started and the pandemic was a power boost to it i'm sure because the new york times didn't put up this article before you know it, it put it out now and it talks about this nice interesting exhibition it actually just really even mentioned just two and one of them is about gifts which I don't think that internet I can be described with gifts only, but like they focus on this and the person who's writing was not an expert in, in internet art either, but he liked uh, this one exhibition and he talked about that, you know, but still like the fact that the New York Times is finally like mentioning and putting it out there and saying, and saying instead of crying because all these museums are closing, we should look into the future, we should look into the internet, what we have inside our homes I mean, I think that that's a big sign, you know, that's a big. Yeah, it does kind of, I totally agree. It feels kind of like COVID and lockdown sort of accelerated a trend that was happening. You know, people have been, there's been lots of VR, you know, museum experiments and, you know, the Google art and culture app with kind of like AR art, you know, it's pretty interesting. Um, and I feel like, I totally agree, just accelerated a lot of this. Everyone was like, oh, shoot, we can't go outside and we want to, you know, you know, want to do something. So um, yeah, it's been kind of fascinating to watch. Um, totally. So more related to kind of back to the collecting and trading, I think what's been kind of interesting, you know, we've seen over the past couple decades, kind of the rise of these, you know, folks who are sort of like, you know, people like to use the word mega dealers, these like super powerful dealers who are all around the world. And then you also have, you know, people who like, and like Charles Sachi, who are like, they're collectors, but they're also dealers. And, you know, he has a museum that's kind of a gallery. Um, and so I wonder, you know, kind of like we've seen with media where you have sort of these, you know, YouTubers who are like superstars now have, you know, more, you know, more subscribers than a, a network cable television uh, channel. Um, curious to get your guys' thoughts around how that relates to things like auctions, you know, do... Are there going to be sort of influencers who have just as much sway as like a Sotheby's like in the market, like, you know, individuals kind of having this, you know, meteoric rise in power? Or do you think uh, with digital, with respect to collecting and trading digital art, does it seem like institutions like Sotheby's will kind of maintain their prestige? Uh, just curious, open, open question. I mean, I would guess, yes, I'm not an expert on those things, but just in terms of what's happened when there's, you know, abundance of anything, you start to become overwhelmed. So in the same way as like, how do you figure out who to watch on YouTube? There's like, I mean, there's literally millions of people broadcasting on YouTube. It's not, not channels on a dial anymore. Well, you start getting an algorithm to help you. You start going to the people who have the most followers already or you go to where they recommend you, you know, so you start to have that recommendation layer that starts to serve the purpose, but ends up controlling some of that. So galleries seem to fulfill some of that role uh, as well in the traditional art market. So I assume there will be that role again in digital. Like just because you don't need the physical space of a gallery doesn't mean you don't need curation to help you sort through all the options that will be presented to you. And you might need it even more potentially. Yeah, I double down on that. We already see a lot of uh, stuff like this happening on the internet. There are various bloggers on crypto Twitter that are advocating about uh, the particular authors or works that are needed to be seen. I believe there are galleries who are exploring digital world and 
uh, yeah, when you have like one thousand buyers and one thousand sellers, you already need to an intermediary to connect between them too. Uh, and all the roles would probably be the same. Uh, maybe some of them would would be eliminated if we able to replace them with technology. But uh, it's it's very social space. Mostly, I believe all the roles would be the same here. I will just tell you, John, that knowing my friends at Christie's and Sotheby's, I'm sure they're on it. <laughs> like there Perfect. must be teams, like you know, in the backstage of these big auction houses that are already like figuring out how to do it. I only hope somebody new that's not crazy that it's not sort of this, but it's an auction house that will sell digital art where art will rise because that's how like you kind of like change the paradigm of of selling art you know like it doesn't have to be always priests and sort of this. hopefully it will be somebody that has a passion for that and a real knowledge that it's not just like asking people to join them in in, in this you know of course they're experts but still that's my hope Awesome. And well, yeah, I think we're up on time. So I really, that's a, that's a good note to end on. And I just want to say thank you uh, to the panelists here. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat today. Thank you.